What you see in front of you are the graphs of the two basic key foundational hyperbolic functions. But if you have seen hyperbole before, if you have studied them in high school, you may wonder in what sense these are hyperbolic functions. They don't look anything like a hyperbola. So what we'll have to do is first of all create some connections between these two graphs and a hyperbola. Just as a refresher, here is what a hyperbola looks like. Um, again, I assume that you have studied a hyperbola before. If you haven't, or even if you have, just a reminder that the equation of a hyperbola, or actually the, the equation of the standard hyperbola, is x squared minus y squared equal 1. There are other hyperbolae which have slightly different uh, equations, which are, however, just variations on this same theme. And I also want to remind you that if you have a hyperbola with this equation and you have a point on that hyperbola, that means that the coordinates of the point x and y will satisfy that equation. The x coordinate square minus the y coordinate square is going to be equal to 1, and that is going to happen no matter which point you're going to consider on the hyperbola. So keep this in mind as we actually construct these hyperbolic functions. Now, to construct the hyperbolic functions, we need very simple ingredients and a very simple recipe. What are the ingredients? The ingredients are, first of all, the usual natural exponential function, which is the function y equals e to the x, whose graph you see here. And we also need its reciprocal, which is uh, y equals e to the minus x, which we can also write as 1 over e, all to the power x, which tells us that it is also an exponential function but it can also be written as 1 over e to the x and that's why I called it the reciprocal. What we're going to do now is take these two very basic ingredients and we're going to put them together into a magic potion that will provide us with these hyperbolic functions. And the recipe for doing that is also quite simple. The first hyperbolic function that we're going to consider is something called the catenary and I'll explain in a few minutes what that word means and why we use it. But the catenary is the function c of x defined by e to the x, the natural exponential, plus e to the minus x, its reciprocal, divided by 2. So yes, it's just the average of the natural exponential and its reciprocal. Fairly simple, isn't it? And then what we're going to do is we're going to consider its conjugate. You may remember also from high school, when you have a sum of two numbers, you can consider its conjugate, that is, the difference between those same two numbers. So we're going to be looking at the function which we're going to denote as s of x given by e to the power x minus e to the minus x over 2. So what that, if you think about it, what that is, is just half of the distance between the natural exponential and its reciprocal. So again, two very simple basic ingredients and a very simple recipe for putting them together. Well, let's see what that provides us. First of all, let's start by having a look at the catenary, c of x equal e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. Again, you can um, enter that in your graphing calculator uh, and you will obtain a graph that looks like this. That's the first graph that I showed you at the beginning. Now, first of all, why do we call this thing a catenary? Because this is exactly the shape of a hanging cable or chain. So if you take a chain, a rope or something, and you suspend it between two points, the shape that this rope or chain or cable will take is actually the shape of a catenary. It's not a parabola, it's something a little bit different. That can be proved using physics and the laws of gravity and so on, but we're not going to go there. Now, what does that have to do with catenary? Well, it comes from the Latin. In Latin, catena means chain, and therefore this, were, this function, which was studied uh, at, at a time when people used Latin very extensively, ended up with the name catenary. Now, um, the domain of this function, if you look at the formula, you'll realize that the domain is all real numbers. I can compute it to the x for any number, I can compute it to, to the minus x for every number, therefore I can compute the catenary for every number. But if you look at the range, you'll notice that everything is positive and in fact the smallest value that this function can take is the value 1, which is obtained at x equals 0. Therefore, the range is going to be anything from 1 and up. And once again, notice, this may look like a parabola, but it's not. Its formula is quite different from that of a parabola, which is a quadratic formula. Uh, this one is exponential, or it involves exponential. It's not an exponential function, but it involves exponential functions.
How about this conjugate thingy, uh, the s of x function? Again, you can use your graphing calculator to look at what the graph looks like, and the graph will look like this. Okay, so it's this is quite different, but it's the same as the second function that I showed you earlier. Okay, and what is the domain in this case? Well, I can still compute this formula for any value of x. It's still just involving the exponential and its reciprocal. So the domain is going to consist of every, everything from negative infinity to infinity. But you'll notice also that the range also goes all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity. And that's because if x is a negative number, then the negative part will uh, prevail in the formula and will send us as far negative as we want. And if x is positive, then the positive part of the formula will prevail and it will take us as, as far up towards infinity as we want. So the range and the domain both consist of all real numbers. Now notice that this graph looks like something familiar. Maybe it looks like y equals tangent of x. But no, it can't be because tangent of x, as we know, has infinitely many asymptotes and this one doesn't. So it's not tangent of x, even though it may remind us of that. Or it may remind us of the inverse sine or arc sine of x. But again, that one has a very restricted domain and this one has as domain anything from negative infinity to infinity. So it can't be that one either. So even though this graph may remind you of some functions that you have seen and are familiar with, it is not. This is a new function and it's a new function that you want to become familiar with. And here we are now ready to look at some properties of these basic hyperbolic functions and see how they relate to the standard hyperbola. So we're going to look, do a little bit of algebra. So let's see, let's start from the function uh, c of x, our catenary, and what we're going to do is square it. So we're going to compute the square of this function. So that is the square of that expression. Well, it's the square of a fraction, so square of the numerator, square of the denominator. The numerator is a binomial, so we need to take the square of the first, which gives us e to the 2x. Double product gives us 2 e to the x, e to the minus x, and square of the second, e to the minus 2x. The denominator is 4. Now, notice that in the middle there, we have e to the x times e to the minus x. Well, by using properties of exponents, that turns out to be e to the 0, which is 1. So we can actually make that expression a little bit easier and just write the middle term as just a 2. We're going to do the same thing with s of x now. So same procedure, we're going to square it, that means squaring a fraction which is a binomial on top, everything looks exactly the same except for the middle term being negative. But it's negative 2 times still e to the x times e to the minus x. They still cancel each other out or they multiply together to a 1. And so we can make that um, a little bit of a shorter formula like this one. All right. So now let's compute c squared of x minus s squared of x. And now you may start to see where the connection with the hyperbola starts coming in. Well, all we have to do is take that expression for c of x and subtract the expression we found for s of x. Now notice we're subtracting those two fractions with the same denominator, so let's look at the numerators. We have an e to the 2x in the first fraction and we have another e to the 2x in the second fraction and they're subtracted, which means we can cancel them. We also have an e to the minus 2x in the first and second fraction and they also cancel. So we're left with the 2 minus minus 2. Well, that's 2 plus 2, which is 4, divided by 4, that all equals to 1. So what have we come up with? We've come up with the fact that for any value of x, the difference between the squares of these two basic hyperbolic functions is always equal to 1. And now you may want to compare that to two things. Well, first of all, to the equation of a hyperbola, as, we, as I showed you earlier, x squared minus y squared equal 1, but also to another fundamental identity that you uh, remember from the past, the one that you've been looking at for the last few seconds, cosine squared plus sine squared equal to 1. And you may start to realize now why I'm calling these two functions c and s. Yes, there is a connection between these two functions and cosine and sine. Let's see what that connection is. Now, the connection is as follows. You may remember the basic Pythagorean identity, cosine squared alpha plus n squared alpha equal 1. That comes from the unit circle. Remember, how do we obtain that? Well, the unit circle has equation x squared plus y squared equal 1. And if you use any value of uh, any point on that uh, circle, which is at a distance alpha along the unit circle, or if you want, with, such that uh, it forms an angle of alpha with the positive x-axis, uh, then, of course, the coordinates of that particular point will be 
cosine alpha and sine alpha. And from that, we say a number of things. We say, first of all, that uh, uh, the basic th Pythagorean identity holds uh, because cosine alpha and sine alpha are the x and y coordinates of that point. So they satisfy cosine squared alpha plus sine squared alpha equal 1. But this also leads us to call the trig functions, what we normally call trig functions, actually circular functions. You may have heard this expression before. I hope you have because we will be using it again. So sine and cosine are called not only trig functions but also circular functions because they're represented on the unit circle with alpha being again the angle or if you want the length of the arc along the unit circle. Well, what we're looking at right now is this different relation c squared of t, okay I'm changing the variable, that's okay we can call the variable whatever we want. So c squared of t minus s squared of t is going to be equal to 1 for any value of t. All right, let's compare that to the hyperbola x squared minus y squared equal 1. And we're only going to be looking at the right branch of that hyperbola. Now, what happens is that if I pick a point on that hyperbola, I can think of that as being a point whose coordinates are going to satisfy x squared minus y squared equal to 1. Therefore, they're going to be c of t and s of t for some number t. Or if you want, you can go the other way around. For any value of t, if I compute c of t and s of t, I'm going to end up with a point on that hyperbola because, of course, c squared minus s squared is equal to 1. And so this is the reason why we're going to call these functions hyperbolic functions. Now you may wonder, in the case of the circular functions, alpha has had a very practical meaning. It was the angle formed or the length of the arc along the unit circle. What does t represent here? Well, we're not going to go into details because it's not really needed. Just suffice to say that if you take the segment joining the origin to this point c of t, s of t, and you look at the area of this sort of triangular shaped region, it turns out that that area is going to be proportional to t. And again, I'm going to just leave it at that. You may want to research this issue on your own. And so that's why we're going to call these functions hyperbolic functions. But because also of the similarity between what we're seeing here and the um, trigonometric functions or the circular function sine and cosine, we're actually ready now to give them some special names. So we're now ready for some formal definitions. Let's start by defining the hyperbolic cosine. What's the hyperbolic cosine? Well, it's a function that will be denoted by COSH of x. And surprise, surprise, it's our good old catenary. Okay. So because the catenary plays a little bit the role of a cosine of the role or has some of the properties of cosines, not in terms of graph, of course, but in terms of algebraic properties in that uh, identity, we're going to call this the hyperbolic cosine. Now, hyperbolic cosine is something, an expression that will be too long for mathematicians. So mathematicians, when they have to refer to this function, will call it the cosh of x. And cosh somehow rhymes with something like posh. I don't know if you pronounce that word that way or you prefer posh. Uh, but it's kind of difficult to get a word that rhymes with cosh. So we're just going to say that cosh rhymes with cosh. And now, also we're going to define the hyperbolic sine. What is it? Well, that's what we saw earlier as the conjugate of the catenary. We're going to call it hyperbolic sine, denoted as SINH of x. And again, it's just the conjugate of the uh, catenary. And just like before, a hyperbolic sine is a little bit too long of a word of an expression, so we're going to call it cinch. This one rhymes with finch very nicely. Now, once we have these two functions and we are thinking of them, them in terms of corresponding to sine and cosine, it's not difficult to take the extra strap and consider something that we would call the hyperbolic tangent. What would that be? Well, it's something we're going to denote as TANH of x, and of course, it's going to be the ratio between cinch and cosh. And we're going to pronounce this tanch which actually rhymes with branch. Okay, so we have cosh, cinch, and tanch. Now, notice a very interesting thing about uh, these functions now. Um, in defining tanch, I followed the usual procedure, the, the, the same procedure that we used for uh, uh, the regular tangent, and defined it as the ratio between cinch and cosh. But cinch and cosh themselves have formulae, so what I can do is I can 
compute the formula for tanj. And you can do it on your own and you'll figure out that it turns out to be this one, e to the x minus e to the minus x divided by e to the x plus e to the minus x. So these are the three basic um, hyperbolic functions. In fact, sinh and cosh are really the two basic ones and then tanj can be obtained from it. And in fact, you might think that you, we may be able to obtain the other ones as well. And that's absolutely true. Uh, in fact, there are several questions that we may want to ask having to do with these, do, these new functions. Let's see what those questions are. So here's some fun stuff to explore. We're going to explore some of that in class. You may want to explore some of that on your own. For instance, um, first of all, explore the fact that these hyperbolic functions work through formulae. Unlike sine and cosine, which really have a strange definition in terms of ratios of sides of right triangles or coordinates of a unit circle, these ones have formulae. Now, mind you, they're formulae that involve exponentials, which are not quite nice algebraic uh, uh, formulae anyway, but they have formulae and we can take advantage of that anytime we need. Also, we can uh, have some fun defining other hyperbolic functions we define tanj. We can define things like hyperbolic secant, hyperbolic cosecant, hyperbolic cotangent. And thank goodness there is no weird kind of pronunciations associated to these three functions. We just call them hyperbolic secant, cosecant, and cotangent. The other thing is we can see if there are other hyperbolic identities. We've seen that just like we have sine squared plus cosine squared equal to 1 for trig or circular functions, we have cosh squared minus sinh squared equal 1 for hyperbolic functions. Well, what about other identities? For instance, can we develop a high an identity for uh, addition formula for sinh or cosh? Or can we develop double angle formula? Well, again, that's worth considering. Remember that these functions are defined through formula and so it should not be very difficult to check or to develop those formula. Now, uh, also, things about derivatives. Again, we are go going to still um, wait a while before we um, dive into derivatives, but you pr most likely remember that the derivative of sine is cosine. Well, guess what? The derivative of sinh is cosh. And you may also remember that the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Well, guess what? The derivative of cosh is, ha ha, surprise. It's not negative sinh, it's actually sinh. So even that negative has gone away. Which means that actually we're going to um, not only be able to develop similar formula, but maybe even some simpler formula. And this is one of the reasons why we're going to be looking at these functions that do provide a lot of useful and uh, simple um, basis for exercise applications and so on of all the calculus properties that we will develop later.